So, we have, you've already seen probably, I don't know, maybe not, that we unboxed Vega. That's in a separate video, so that, you know, because no one cares about unboxing after the fact. That video is going to go straight to the bottom of the list. I just want to know about Vega 64, RX Vega, the video card, and also 56. We've got both the 56 and the 64, the, you know, regular edition, the ones that are going to be MSRP 399 and MSRP 499 available to take a look at. But we've only had them a limited time, so this is just our impressions video. Before we get to our impressions, we have to talk a minute about the hype train. Because good lord, has this been on the hype train? <laughs> you know, I mean there's just there's so much anger and and combativeness online and you know, people love it or people hate it, people want it to be the best thing ever or people want it to fail miserably. It doesn't do either of those. Well, I mean it's it's successful, but it's never going to live up to the level of hype that it's been given. It's <laughs> impossible. No matter what it did, it could cure cancer, and it would not live up to the level of hype that has been built. I don't up want around. a cure for cancer. I want 120 FPS of 4K. This is all that I want, and it doesn't. It doesn't do that. Well, I, I need to post my outrage. Uh, now, we, we want to talk about value. This card is not going to top the charts. It's not going to beat the best thing that Nvidia has in performance. It's just not going to do it. But when we talk about value, you know, maybe it could. But there is a huge pitfall when it comes to the value of these cards. And it's got nothing to do with AMD. <laughs> oh, the cryptocurrency miners and the <laughs> retailers, they're going to destroy everything. Uh, there's a certain amount of anxiety that I'm, I, I detect from just reading public internet posts from Team Red about the pricing around these cards and availability and and you know what what people's expectations are it's like wow this you know this retailer is selling this card for seven hundred dollars clearly it should be a performance equivalent of a seven hundred dollar card it's like no this is completely nuts if you look at new egg right now there are new egg video cards selling the 1070s nvidia 1070s selling for like six hundred dollars eight hundred dollars the mining stuff has made it completely nuts the rx 580s We've seen RX 580s go for five, six hundred dollars, and that's like a 250, 275 dollar MSRP card, and it's just it's supply and demand and the cryptocurrency thing and that kind of thing. Unequivocally, these cards are a huge win for AMD. They reintroduce competition to the market. Uh, the power utilization is 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 really high. That is the most surprising thing about the cards is that the, the amount of power that they use for the performance that they deliver, but it's not outside the realm of, you know, something reasonable. Now, for the Vega 56, it is $399. Keep that number in your head. That is what it should cost. If you're paying more than that, and you're expecting to get a card that gives you the value that you pay, you're not gonna get it. The Vega 64, $499. Now, we know those two for sure. There are other versions of this card, and we know you can get them in what they call the Radeon packs, where it's muddled with some other things. Uh, we don't know exactly what those cards will retail for by themselves. There's gonna be a liquid cooled um, RX Vega 64, which will be able to hit its boost clocks longer because of you know thermal considerations and things like that. We're also gonna see you know aftermarket versions of these cards from all our favorite OEMs like Asus and Gigabyte and you know everybody. Uh, that have improved cooling and an improved, you know, stuff for the car. So if you wait a little longer, you can you can get that sort of stuff. But at, in terms of like August 28th launch day, Vega RX 56 399. That's what you should be looking for. Yeah, and you should really watch out for paying more for these things. I know it's been a long wait, and you desperately want it and the hype is in your blood at this point, but <laughs> it, you, you do not want to pay a hundred, two hundred dollar premium for these cards. You just don't want to do it. We've replaced the, the blood with liquid hemoglobin. There's a lot of salt on the internet too. There's a lot of people that are like, oh my God, I didn't get you know an early release or, or I need an early release or is, there, is this benchmark accurate or is this rumor accurate? Calm down, it's totally cool. The hardware is here. The compute units are here. We verified that. There's software updates and there's all sorts of fun things that can happen on the software and the driver side and, and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a brand new card. It's a brand new architecture and you're gonna get the wrinkles that come with a brand new everything. Yeah, you might get as much as 10% more out of these cards once AMD has you know the drivers really, really optimized and taken care of. But 
because of the memory in these cards, because that's, you know, the next generation, that you're probably gonna get a lot of longevity. So if you're looking at like, well, I can get this other card, this current generation card for the same price, and I'm looking at these benchmarks and they're not wildly different, that might be the deciding factor for you. In general, I would say it's not a good idea to buy something based on you know, promised future functionality. That's not something anybody should ever do. That said, having owned a 290, well, between the two of us, having owned a 290 and a 390 and a 480 and a, and a 580 for testing, those cards have aged really well. I don't think there's any denying that. The 7970 is one of the best aging cards that has ever existed in terms of like its useful lifetime. So AMD has a really good track record of providing graphics cards that perform really well over a relatively long period of time. And I see nothing in, in Vega that makes me think that it will be any different. I think that it's gonna have a really long service lifetime compared to other graphics cards. Now, another downside that I can think of because of the power requirements of these cards, Thunderbolt enclosures are getting really popular. We saw, you know, Apple adopt the 580 and their external Thunderbolt enclosure. We're starting to see Thunderbolt really take off because there's a lot of laptops with Thunderbolt. These cards in Thunderbolt, I think are gonna be really problematic just because of their power requirements and the power that is provided by the Thunderbolt enclosures that I know currently exist today on the market. And that is unfortunate because I think AMD has the superior technology for dealing with graphics cards on Thunderbolt. They've got X-Connect. X-Connect is a great, great technology. It works really, really well. It is astonishing how well it works for basically giving you plug and play graphics cards on a Thunderbolt interface. And so it's like, okay, I want Vega 56 and a Thunderbolt enclosure. And it's like, oh, two four pin power connectors. Uh, I don't know, or well, it's two, it's two eight pin power connectors, but four of them give you 12 volts. So you see what I did there. Uh, the other thing is that it's coming kind of late in the product cycle. So uh, you know, that's not the timing could have been better. Yeah. Also coming during a time when you might've just written a tuition check and bought a bunch of books Going and back to school. sent your kids back to school. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not the best time to release it, but. Uh, but unequivocally, it is a win for AMD and it is a win for marketplace competition for graphics cards that cost more than about $250, give or take. Now, apart from raw performance, there are some other things that make these cards stand out, that make them unique when we're talking about comparisons to what's already on the market. FreeSync, AMD FreeSync. Finally, you can have a high performance card and do FreeSync and specifically, the marketing material from AMD that we have seen for the last six months has been smooth uh, gaming experience, free sync, enhanced free sync. And these cards so far in our testing live up to that. We've got some new widescreen monitors, 3440 by 1440 that support free sync and some of these features. And AMD has said, we're targeting, you know, a 48 to 100 Hertz gaming experience. These cards will deliver that. I mean, it depends on the graphic settings and things like that. There are some differences between the 56 and the 64, but in terms of delivering 2560 by 1440 gaming and 3440 by 1440 gaming at high refresh rates, these cards do it so yeah. far in our testing. During our testing, we found ourselves saying a lot, this looks really smooth. <laughs> you know, I mean, totally subjective, right? Oh, really smooth. And you look at the FPS counter and it's like, oh, 30, 25 FP FPS, but it still looks really smooth. So, you know, there's probably something to that. You know, it really is a smooth experience. We've got a lot more testing planned and that camera right there, that can go up to 180 FPS. So I can't wait to try to figure it out or make sure that it's not placebo or like do a double blind test. I'm really, I've got no idea, but we're gonna figure it out. There, that has to be quantifiable in data. And it could be that I've never really experienced a G-Sync monitor. I've never owned a G-Sync monitor. I've played with them at Computex and vendor booths and, and things like that, but I haven't logged a significant number of hours on a G-Sync monitor. I've spent most of my time on FreeSync and these new cards that are super high performance, it's really impressive. On the other end of the spectrum, low performance. Now, why would we talk about low performance? Well, they have something called Radeon Chill. And if you have a really well optimized game that's still super popular like Dota or Overwatch or Doom, these cards will actually underclock, but it won't hurt your performance. So, you know, that they're, they're power hungry. You know, <laughs> Very they, power hungry. They get hot. So when it doesn't need it, it's able to not 
use all that power and not use all that performance, which is a nice feature. But without limiting your frame rate. Mm -hmm. The nice thing that happens there is that if your graphics card can respond at 200 FPS, but your monitor is only 100 FPS, uh, you don't busy the graphics card rendering all 200 of those frames. You can actually have the game wait a little while before actually responding uh, to you know the next frame event. And by waiting, you can wait for user input. So if you have a user that clicks a button or does something like that, you can sort of change the frame timing just a little bit and get a better response time. And that's what AMD says is going on in their improved response time by using this type of technology. Now, if we're talking about FreeSync, we should also talk about the number of monitors that are on the market. There are over 200 FreeSync monitors available on the market. And some of the bundles where you can buy a monitor and a motherboard and a processor um, together, you get a little bit of a discount. The monitors are, are all FreeSync. Now, sometimes you can get some of the components of the bundle actually cheaper on Amazon. I talked to my contacts about that uh, at AMD. And they're working on that. So they're, they're working to get everybody together to offer bundles that are at a lower price that you can get the components for individually on Amazon. But it's a little bit like whack-a-mole, so you gotta give them some slack. Now the HBM2 memory is, that's why this is the next generation. That's what sets this apart. And it allows what AMD calls rapid packed math. Now this, you know, we talk about gaming a lot. We don't really, we don't do a ton of gaming. We do some gaming, but we love to talk about things like machine learning, and of course the dreaded cryptocurrency mining. <laughs> and that is what this memory is really gonna lend itself well to. We're talking about uh, 25 teraflops at half precision. This is really, really incredible to deliver 25 teraflops at half precision, basically in a consumer card. So I think we're gonna see widespread adoption when we see you know, RockM and some of the other APIs that are updated, I mean, I can't wait to do the cats per second benchmark on this card. It's really, it's going to be something else to take a look at it. Yeah. And it, we'll have to wait for some of those things to get updated to deal with this, but definitely when it does, we'll take a look at it. And uh, we expect it to outperform the competition in that area when it might not with gaming. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, you know, the next generation HBM products, well, HBM really is the future. I mean, HBM in general, putting multiple pieces of silicon in one package. We've seen that work very successfully in Ryzen. We've seen that work very successfully in other areas, USB flash controllers and some other specialty niche stuff. HBM2 is where the industry has to head to lower latency and provide more bandwidth. And here it is in a graphics card that's not $6,000. There's also a number of new and updated technologies in these new cards. The high bandwidth cache and how that works, we really probably should do a totally separate video on that because it's really interesting. Then you've also got the power management stuff. Now this card is an overclockable card even though it's got a blower style cooler. I mean, I can't wait for aftermarket cooling, you know, super enhanced cooling stuff for this, but uh, even with the blower style cooler, it is actually possible to overclock the card. And uh, most games, it seemed like if I enabled frame rate targeting and I up the power profile like 20%, I can overclock the memory to like 895, 900 megahertz, which is a pretty good overclock, then my minimums in games would be much higher. The exception to this was Tomb Raider. With Tomb Raider, uh, to max out my minimums, uh, I had to set it in turbo, just set it in turbo basically and forget it, turn off the frame rate targeting and turn off everything in DirectX 12 mode. With that, my absolute minimums at the worst part of the benchmark was like 40, but I don't really know how good the, the Tomb Raider benchmark is because actually playing the game um, with frame rate targeting felt like a smoother experience, but the frame rates that were reported, the averages and the minimums were higher in turbo with frame rate targeting turned off. So. That's something that needs more testing. Your mileage may vary. Now, most of you are probably, you know, gritting your teeth and saying, shut up. I didn't click this video to hear you talk. I clicked this video so you could show me benchmarks and I could convince myself to buy this video card. So uh, we've benchmarked a few select games and a few other, you know, canned benchmarks. And so here they are. <laughs> but I like hearing this talk. How else are we gonna power our balloon that takes us around the world? <laughs> our ego balloon. <laughs> Somebody compared us to those old guys on the Muppets, which I'm okay with that comparison. Yeah. <laughs> Neither rare nor well done, we must be medium. So today's embargo update, and you're gonna be seeing a lot of benchmarks from a lot of channels. Yeah, and the numbers, we've looked at a lot of games, we've compared them to the NVIDIA benchmarks, obviously, and the older AMD cards. 
Those of you, as we said before, that are expecting some incredible new thing that's gonna blow everything else out of the water, sorry, that's not what this is. It's comparable in most cases to the 1070 and the 1080. It's looking like the Vega 56 is the best deal all around though, because you can overclock the Vega 56 much more than we were able to overclock our Vega 64. Now it might be that true that we've got a cherry picked Vega 56, but you can get within spitting distance of the 1080 with the Vega 56 with the overclock. We were getting 1566, almost 1600 stable core clock and over 950 on the memory clock and it was completely fine in the Vega 56. The Vega 64, we couldn't push the core more than like 2%. If you can find these at retail, it does make them a good value for gaming. For what they are and what they cost, I can't argue too much with it. It would have been nice to see them sooner, but overall, these are competitive products with the products that are available in the marketplace, at least as far as the NVIDIA 1070 and the 1080 go. Now, we initially thought that we would see huge performance increases here. For those of you who are into the crypto mining, as much as we may hate you for destroying the market, that's a valid thing. And it does well at that, but not as well as we thought it would. Yeah, it's basically the same performance as Vega Founders Edition. I mean, we're, we're getting 35, 40 mega hashes per second. Rumor has it there may be a mining specific driver coming from AMD, but you know, I guess for $400, 30 to 40 mega hashes per second is not bad, but it seems like if you were getting 580s at retail, that would be a better deal. For Linux, we tested Civ 6. We didn't really test a lot of games. At 1440p, we were getting a not really playable 12 to 15 frames per second. So those are our preliminary numbers on the benchmarks. This is a very early drivers. Things are likely to change. We're not super awesome at benchmarking yet, but we wanted to give you an early look. It's gonna be a long road between now and August 28th, and you can definitely expect more data from us. But so far, it does look like AMD has pulled off a win in terms of market competition. That's only, I mean, that's really good for consumers. I would buy this card, but once again, our, you know, we, we have two of these cards. They're both good values. I'd probably buy the 64, but I would only buy it for $499. Keep that in mind. <laughs> I would not pay $700 for it. No one should pay $700 for this card. Yes, absolutely. So that's been a quick look at the new RX Vega cards from AMD. If you have any ideas for stuff that we can do for testing or if there's anything we should check out or if you spot anything we did wrong, it's like, oh, the performance was gimped because you didn't delete the INI file and put a capital Z on line 37 because that can happen. Definitely let us know in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell. I'm Ryan. And we'll see you there.